Okay, well I'm Paul Weston, I'm a Glastonbury based author. I'm somebody that has given a lot of attention to synchronicity and what I consider to be one of the most intriguing aspects of all in the topic, which is whether it's possible to actually provoke it, whether there are some means that one can adopt to actually help to stimulate it that arise out of one's own personal peculiar predispositions and whilst what I relay is relative to my unusual psyche I feel that enough of it uh, has a wider relevance that people can pick up their own version of what I'm talking about so I'm somebody who's always been obsessed with dates with anniversaries with the mystery of the passing of time and how that feels, that there's something not quite right about it. People just accept the passing of time. I haven't done since I was like seven years old. So I was inspired to just keep very basic one-line diary entries on a sheet of A4 line paper that just gave the barest possible outline of what I'd done at a particular time. And that really doesn't take an awful lot of effort, but I've come to discover it's pretty untypical behaviour. So on that basis, if I start reading a book on a particular day, I note that. If I watch a movie on a particular day, that becomes part of the one-line diary entry. Where I may have been, certain things I may have done, they can all be accommodated in a kind of short and in one line. And I also kept separate pages where I kept note of just lists of specifically the books I've read, the films I'd read, in the order that I'd done them. And this just helps you know what the hell's going on in your life, but it's also interesting because I started when I was about 19. By the time you get to 30 and you've got a decade of that information, you maybe start to intuit that there are certain patterns that recur in your life that are possibly a bit odd beneath the surface and you've got all this data that you can kind of check up on. And I started to play games with the information that I had and a lot of this is, re is recorded, for example, in my book Avalonian Eon and also Atagartis. Back in 1987, great example, I'd transitioned out of a five-year relationship, been very, very traumatic, and there was a particular couple of days where the whole thing had gone into meltdown, and I had very clear memories of the very start of that process, where I'd say, it's all very simple, I'd just been round a friend's house, it was in a Tai Chi, and I'd lent him a whole bunch of books on Taoism and stuff, and on that day, I'd started reading a book, about Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh, as he was called then, it was called Death Comes Dancing. And when I got home, I had got out on a video rental the movie Big Trouble in Little China. And I even kept a note of the fact that I'd smoked a couple of spliffs that night. And this was all kind of in the memory bank. Now, five years later, I had a sense that something emotionally was still not resolved from that period of time. And strangely enough, my friend had still got my books and I got this really strange idea that I would go and retrieve them ex on the exact same date that I'd lent them to him. And once I contacted him, found out that he was around, I then decided that I would multiply that resonance by reading the same book, Death Comes Dancing, getting big tr trouble in Little China out on DVD rental again and smoking the exact same number of spliffs. So I did precisely that and I had no idea what the hell I was doing or why I was doing it, but it just felt like some strange game to play. And the very next day I was living in South End, lovely summer's day, and I thought, I bet it'd be great in Glastonbury right now. I rung a friend of mine up. We ended up going down that night, sleeping on the tour. The very next day, walking down the high street, outside Gothic Image, I bumped into the woman who's... I'd party company with all those years before. She's just had a baby. I didn't know about this. I'd had no contact with her. I'd been to Glastonbury a zillion times in the interim. I'd never seen her, but I bumped into her right then. We ended up going up on the tour for the sunset. Some it was resolved, some healing, some transformation occurred. And I just thought, 
that's really weird this is a good game I'm going to play this a bit more and see what kind of results I can get out of it so that summer if I suddenly felt like I wanted to read a book on a particular subject I'd think oh didn't I read that book round about this time back in 1983 and I'd look in my diary and oh yeah okay so I will read, start reading that book on exactly the same day again or I feel like watch a particular movie again so I think I'll watch it on exactly the same day and we'll just see what is stirred up by that and it wasn't too long before another great example came in because 10 years previously in 1981 I'd been busted at the Stonehenge Festival for possession of multiple amounts of different drugs and I stood a good chance on the basis of what was happening at the time of maybe actually going down for a couple of months in prison which was a nightmare outcome for me. I'd gone to appear in court in Salisbury, this is all in my book Avalonia Neon and I was very very fortunate I got fined £250, I didn't go down tremendous amount of emotion about that obviously so 10 years later i'm looking i'm zeroing in on that date but that's only one of the things i'm thinking about uh in 1982 i read colin wilson's book on gurdjieff the war against sleep it's only 100 pages you could read it in a couple of hours bang i read that on that day there was uh, another book about gurdjieff um by thomas de hartman only 100 pages read that on the same day and then I read the Bag of a Gita, which I'd taken to Salisbury with me the night before I was due to appear in court in the morning. So I thought, well, all of this, there's all sorts of things going on here, but at least I'm not in a position like I was 10 years ago where I might go to prison. But on the next morning, which was the exact day I appeared in court, there's a letter waiting for me. It's a summons to appear in court uh, for non-payment of council tax, poll tax as it was then, £250, the exact same amount that I'd been fined exactly 10 years previously to the day. So this was absolutely tremendous to me. I just thought to myself, I have hit a methodology here. I don't know what this is all about, but it works and I'm going to adhere to it because, you know, there was obviously a weakness in my lifestyle. I preferred to buy books and come to Glastonbury than pay poll tax and that came back on me. But the way in which it came back on me with that exact symmetry said to me that there is some bigger part of my life which seeks to make itself known for this very strange means. So from that point on, for, for years, two or three years, I played those games. All kinds of things emerged, and, and out of that uh, came a far larger gnosis, if you like, of ways to play with the apparent timeline of my landing coordinates, this, this you know, not exactly natural calendar system and dating system. And I discovered, this was in 1992 when I was 33 years old, that I've, and I've never been one for what I'd call new age numerology. I like the Kabbalah, I like Gematria, I like the way it plays into the magic of the likes of Alistair Crowley and Dion Fortune, but what I call new age numerology didn't do it for me at all. But in 1992, I kept hearing about the number 33, and I was 33, and one night, for some totally unknown reason, I started to tot up my actual date of birth by the most simple means possible 5th of april 1959 so that's 5 plus 4 plus 1 plus 9 plus 5 plus 9 equals 33 so i thought hmm you know a rational part of my mind derided this but another part of me thought is there some way in which i can test out whether there is something about this information that works for me so at that time, because we're in the 1990s, you would get 33 days. Days that added up by the same numerology to 33. So I decided to experiment. And if there was something I needed to do, like write an official letter or, or, or something that was, was kind of significant, but it could wait a couple of days, if there was a 33 day in that week, I would do it on that day and I would just see how that worked out and eventually the triumph of that, the mysterious triumph of it, was that I was potentially being offered a kind of redundancy payment uh, which would enable me to actually move from Essex, move to Glastonbury and just about survive for a couple of months. So I thought, you know, the actual filling in of the official forms for this is, is an important thing. I'm going to do it on a 33 day. What have I got to lose? 
So I did. Having done that, that's clearly out of my control. Clearly out of my conscious control. The feedback that I then get telling me that I have actually been accepted for this scheme, that I will get redundancy payment, and this enables me to move from South East Essex to Glastonbury, actually comes on the next 33 day. Now, this is entirely preposterous, but it, I'm sure you, everyone will understand that's more than enough to convince me that I'm on a winner. Now, do I believe that if I hadn't have done it on a 33 day, I would not have got it? No, not necessarily. But what that did was it kept on confirming what I call higher dimensional symmetry, higher dimensional coordinates behind the illusion of third dimensional time and the aging of our bodies in a straight sequence. There is something else playing out which connects with the very deepest tendencies in our, uh, you know, the star of our true will. And over the years, I, I pretty much let this go and found that it did itself. After a certain point, I was so given over to this part of my consciousness that it, that it literally does itself. And this is fused in with uh, a very deep-seated creativity that I bring to all my projects. To me, creativity, art, magic, they're inseparable. And even if you're working with set dates, for example, particular things happen on certain anniversaries, so maybe you... Um, give over some kind of commemoration to that. Somehow or another, there is some creative process that, that weaves in with this. And only in, in the last few months, uh, I've had great, great, great examples of this, which speak about this, this ripples out beyond one's own individual peculiarities in, in, into bigger things. I had a, an, an idea and inspiration to uh, put on a, uh, in Glastonbury, a William Blake festival. We'd have some poetry recitations, we'd try and get some musicians to give musical performances of his poems. I became inspired to rapidly write a book, which I managed to manifest as William Blake and the Glastonbury Gnosis. And part and parcel of how, how that ultimately landed was that the most important part of it was that we needed a date for our musical evening and the King Arthur pub in Benedict Street in Glastonbury was the place it was going to happen and it was down to when did they have a date that we could use and the date we originally wanted was not available but the date the next week was and this was August the 10th Friday August the 10th so everything else was kind of back engineered from that uh, the night that I launched my book with a lecture that was the day before the Thursday that was now set up and we had episodes at the Market Cross in Glastonbury reciting poetry and so on on the Wednesday that was kind of set in motion and I was still writing my book and I knew I was going to give over to uh, a certain amount of mentioning of the beat poet Allen Ginsberg because he's a major devotee of Blake and had been a transmitter of the message, the work of Blake into the 60s and beyond. I started writing about him and the day after I'd started writing about him, I realised that the day I'd started writing was actually Allen Ginsberg's birthday. Now I've had this kind of thing happen a few times, that's just a little indicator that okay you're on the right path here that there is an energy activated you know when I'm engaged in a writing process uh, I look out for things like that that tell me that a deeper level of voltage has been been switched on and that we're now well involved so I was aware that um, in 1968 there'd been uh, a lot of tumult at the, the infamous Democratic Party convention which had turned into, from a protest into what was later described as a police riot and that Allen Ginsberg had been quite prominent in that and at uh, a scene in a park uh, full of protesters he had uh, sung a version of a Blake poem called The Grey Monk and Whilst I was reading up about this, uh, I discovered further that the tune that had come into his head uh, for him to perform this had been a few weeks earlier, and he got it on the way home from the famous Neil Cassidy's funeral in Mexico, and the date that he got the tune in his head was August the 10th, 1968. So exactly 50 years to the day later, we were having our musical evening in the King Arthur. It was absolutely obvious to me that 
because we've got recordings of Ginsburg and the tune that he used, somebody simply had to perform that that night. So I was very fortunate we've got a lot of creative people here in Glastonbury, local musician Michael Tyak of Circulus fame. When, when I told him the story, when I told him of, of, of what was going on with all this, he immediately said, I want to do this, I'm going to do this. So that set in motion um, a very, very interesting dynamic behind that evening that got so complicated that I'm currently writing an extensive blog post about it because the intention was that I then brought in a whole load of photos of Ginsburg in 68 of the Chicago protests. We were going to show them as a backdrop while the song was being performed and as if out of nowhere I came to become aware of uh, an anarchic Blake group in London called the Blake Block who've kind of come into existence this year and have been protesting against Trump, protesting against uh, Tommy Robinson and so on. I've got a fantastic banner with uh, Blake and Art on it uh, and I'd seen some photos of them in London, I was going to weave that in. All of this was set up and, and, and I met these people and I came to the Blake Festival and I came to my presentation. On the night in question, um, the guy on, on setting all the visuals up had trouble with the black and white photos, the camera went in and out of focus. It was almost like there was so much power running through the idea that if we'd have completely and utterly manifested it, I don't know what levels of turbulence and weirdness would have broken out. But we've got some fantastic footage that at least shows what an incredible performance it was. This was something that I feel was determined and set in motion by my peculiar mindset and my receptivity <coughs> to these anniversaries, these dates. And also being ready to just be up and to up and run with the ball the moment these things happen, to have a creative response, to know that it's not just something that you mull over in your head and think, well, that's far out. You actually go out and do something with it. And in doing that, you actually amplify it. You make it all the more dynamic. And, and, and this was richly satisfying because it wasn't just about me. It was about a whole bigger mysterious thing that echoes out into the body politic, into the body of Albion. And has set us up for something that we're going to do next year where we're going to have a second Blake Festival on the exact 50th anniversary of the three days of Woodstock. There's already fun and games coming in there. But all the way through, the, the covers of my books, the cover of my book, Out of God, is the, the creative process that kicked in with that, that actually lasted about six months, was so complicated that it actually became part of the contents of the book. I had to write an appendix uh, full of a, a lot of information, uh, that was basically telling the story of how the cover of the book came to be completed. There's a whole YouTube lecture called Star of Ishtar, which is all about my use of anniversaries, my coming to awareness of this whole 33 business and how I made use of it. There are various um, editions of the Rune Soup podcast of Gordon White where I've talked at length, at considerable length, about this process. But my sense is that what's important about synchronicity is <coughs> it shows whenever it happens, uh, however meaningful or meaningless it might appear, that you have, have you are connected at a deeper level uh, beyond the consensus immediately at that point. You know, if we go back to the source material to Jung, there's a famous story in, in synchronicity of how he's engaged in, in therapy with a, a woman and it's, it's kind of blocked and she has a dream about a scarab beetle and while she's telling it to him there's a rusting on the window and he intuitively opens up the window and this very rare, uh, unknown in the region scarab beetle flies in which he manages to catch and says here it is, there's this immediate breaking of, of this barrier in her psyche and the therapy proceeds apace. Other synchronicities are more difficult to gauge because they don't carry that level of meaning. Um, and they simply show, uh, in my opinion, that the deeper levels of the psyche are engaged and they are encouragement. You know, and they can come in all sorts of forms. Uh, as well as one-line diary entries, I also have kept uh, dream diaries for 
about 25 years worth of dream diaries uh, and this encourages interaction with the part of your mind that dreams and I had a dream one night that uh, I got a phone bill uh, and it was 110 pounds and 94 pence uh, and I had been expecting a phone bill and I was worried about how expensive it was and then I woke up and there was a phone bill waiting for me and I opened the envelope and it's 110 pounds and 94 pence well that's absolutely far out you know, I, I would say it's not just precognition, it's a synchronicity. Uh, but at the same time, it's absolutely bleeding useless. You know, how does that help me? What difference does that make? Uh, now, at that time in my life, there were a lot of big issues that I was trying to figure out. What that told me was, don't throw tarot cards about, don't do I Ching oracles, don't, never mind astrology, never mind all of the kind of means whereby people try to get a handle on what's going on for them you've got to figure this out by some other way. The, the whole pathways to your higher levels of consciousness are quite clearly operating. Any time any urgent message is really needed to get to you, it can happen. You know, you've, got, you've just got that absolutely exact. That part of your brain is working, mate. Don't worry about it. You, it's, it's, it's willpower, it's, it's, some kind of, it's some other aspect of, is needed for you to navigate this. There are times when you have to make big decisions in your life without knowing or having the slightest clue what is going on. But the faith, the higher faith, the emotional tone that comes with such synchronicities enables you to handle that far more effectively. So it's a huge subject. But um, the thing is, it's always, there's always tremendous pleasure to be gained from any synchronicity. And the best ones do carry an absolutely unique emotional tone because they carry you way beyond the normal sense of, of space-time and 3D. We'll do that bit again. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's, that's pretty much it, I'd say. I mean, if you want to sort of chuck in any questions, yeah. that's, that's kind of 25-minute dense hit of... Yeah, 23, just well, on Oh, uh, 23, <laughs> yeah. all the better. No, that, yeah, really good. Enjoyed listening a lot, thank you. Um... <coughs> um, so after I invited you to do this, the two nights following, I had dreams of, with you. One was I walked into a cafe. You were sat at a table. You turned around and said, "Hello, Matt." Right. G gave me a hug. Yeah. And the next night, the opposite way round, I was sat in a cafe. You came. Right. 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 I don't know if that's relevant. I I I, I work with dreams, like keep a dream diary and things like that, and. So this was relevant to me in some way. Well, it shows two-way interaction. Yeah. Right. You know, that's at, at the very least, you know, that it's not just going in one direction, it's going in both directions. So, you know, we're feeding into a summit between each other here. Mm. Uh, and hopefully part of that is the bigger collective awareness of Glastow and how to play games with all this stuff and stir it up. You know, and, and that little story about the Blake Festival, I think, was an example of how my peculiar temperament and my way of doing things clearly somehow came out in that but it was no longer just about me and my particular journey anymore there was something wider going on that it's like um i think it's like learning a language that's obviously the case with dreams you know it is like learning a language and of, of how you relate to them and i think synchronous is is not separate from that undoubtedly <coughs> i've I mean, I've listened to a lot of Terence McKenna, and um, so I've, I'm kind of imprinted by his, by his, yeah, 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 um, version of it all. Um, and well, I can definitely relate a lot to, of your stories to, in a similar way to the patterns that he if, was if discovering. If you went his. all the way through Avalonian and Eon, you'd find that I do start having what I consider to be my own version of of time wave zero, right. where there is a point where pretty much everything becomes synchronicity. And once I'd had a couple of years of messing about with all this endless, you know, deliberately reading books and pumping up the anniversaries, I would find, you know, people would, would ring me up on the exact anniversary the last time I talked to them. And they, they had no idea of it, you know, and things, it would be like, this was quite limited because there was only a couple of TV channels. You know, movies would come on TV on the exact anniversary that I'd watch those movies, but not on TV or for video or, or right. whatever. The contents of my psyche were absolutely everywhere, you know, or, or 
a particular video of something would be released and it was five years to the day that I had particularly memorable occasion just before Christmas when a bunch of people had all come around and we'd all got stoned and watched that video and it was just it was just like virtually everything I saw and everything that was going on was just you know taking me ever deeper into that until yeah obviously there's only so far you can go into that fractal it, it's just sort of trying to push you into something else and I think that's something else you know that involved our oh, wellies in the mind calendar but also that thing of like it virtually does itself I still keep the diaries but I don't really play with them anymore you know I like to be aware of what was going on a year ago two years three years ago but I don't play with it in the same way but it, and they, it simply keeps the circuits open so that these things they happen and you know it's my think these things happen to most people but they haven't got the data bank Right. They haven't got those one line diaries that they could do that they that is all you need to check the you know that has actually happened on the exact anniversary five years, two years, whatever the hell. I think that kind of thing is happening a lot, and I think whatever it is it wants when you interact with it, it inevitably becomes more you know it's like it's just like with dreams you know. The old cliche about if you keep a dream diary, your dreams start responding and they get weirder and more interesting. It's the same with, with this kind of malarkey, I'm sure. Do you think that's what the universe is encouraging us to do then? Abso- absolutely. Yeah, I think it is. You know, uh, uh, And I can only say on the basis of my experience, that's definitely been the case. You know, that it, it wants people to... When I talk to people about all this stuff and they get into it and they start their own experiments, it immediately just revs up and they realise that in fact it's always, always been happening. It's just a, a law of nature, a law of the psyche. And we're just, you know, deep in our understanding of it. But that, the idea of treating it like a game I think is very important and obviously to have, have fun with it uh, and, you know, deeper stuff will reveal itself. What I've talked about just in the last half hour, it's, 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 it's got a sense of, of being the most intimate thing in the whole of your life. It's more you than your everyday life. You know, you, the, the thing that I, in Avalon and Eon, at the point where I start to realise that side of myself, I realise that sense, whatever it is, is living my life. So it is actually more truly me than the third dimensional, you know, transient, egoic mind of whatever phase of my life I happen to be in. So the game, the real magic, the real mysticism is dissolve the barriers. So that when you say I, you are no longer talking about the transient 3D, you are talking about that mysterious star of whatever it is that's in hyperspace that has got all that symmetry that's always already the case. And that was, you know, that's my game. That's what I've done in Avalonia Neon. That's what I've done in Atgaris, is to just dissolve, continually try and dissolve those barriers so that I have that sense that, you know, whatever turbulence arises, there is that larger identity living you. And you never lose sight of it. And you never lose the feeling tone of it. Well, Cosmic Trigger is, is, is the book by Robert Anton Wilson, okay. which for many people was the catalyst to just getting their minds thoroughly blown it is one of one of the truly great classics of the 20th century and july the 23rd is is a massively significant date in there and i have found because i have the book is such a gigantic influence on me that i it's always one of the most important days in my calendar and i've found that things just some years it's pretty extreme Last year was very extreme. The whole thing about the uh, creation of the Atagaris cover um, is tied in with that. Okay. Uh-huh. But that, I can only say, if you haven't read Cosmic Trigger, then please do so, because you won't be disappointed. I mean, that's the first time I encountered McKenna, actually. There's a whole bunch of stuff about Leary and Crowley and psychedelics, and you name it. Okay. You name it, it's all in there, man. That's one of the great mind-blowing books of the 20th century. Not many people come away from that book without being significantly mutated. <laughs> Noted. Thank you. <laughs> uh, is there a part of the year where you're more creative, where you're more productive creatively? Nah, I wouldn't say there is, actually, because I've been writing for 20 years. You know, I started writing Avalonia Neon in 1999, 
and there hasn't really been a time where I've had something on the go. I mean, it varies according to how many hours I might have to be working or giving over to 3D. But uh, there's always something going on, yeah. You know, there's part of every year that's got associations that are full of voltage. Okay, what's your what's the current um, book you're working on, and when's that likely to be? Right, released? okay. Um, I've been working on a book about the occult battle of Britain, centred on Dion Fortune and her contribution, uh, the Glastonbury visualizations, and so on, on and off, for eight years now. Uh, it's time for me to complete that. What I have, one of the you know we talked about creativity. One of the the great things that I've managed to do for the last however many years is back engineer my books. Like there's a conference date or a lecture date that's given to me months in advance. And I think, can I get that book out by then? I talk to the publisher, I talk to my graphics man, when do you need me to have done this in order for it to be delivered for me to launch it at this? There's an occult conference in Glastonbury next February. Uh, I would very much like to get this one done by then and being as the last five books that I've done have all been done like that you know it's like the Blake thing I had a le I had a basically agreed to do a lecture in the middle of the Blake festival and because I had about four months full knowledge of that I suddenly thought hang on a moment is it possible that I could get a book out by then and because I've got the momentum of having done that so many times it was right let's try it and, and I did, and I've already got hundreds of pages for this cold battle of Britain. So that's going to get intense, <laughs> but only makes the subject matter is not lightweight. The, mm. One of the reasons why I've ebbed and flowed with it is every time I get involved in it, really involved in it, it stirs up all manner of peculiarities. So um, I'm digging in for that one, but I will make it happen. Okay, and so have you got any other events or anything that you want to? At the end of this year, um, again, this is typical because um, I had talked about maybe doing an event before, in December for the Positive Living Group, and it did vaguely occur to me that I would do something that linked together William Blake Project and the Dion Fortune Project through the use of the hymn Jerusalem in the First World War and how certain things that happened in the First World War fed into the mindset of Dion Fortune in the Second World War. The date they had in mind for me didn't, somebody else wanted to do that. They offered me the date the week before. They said, oh, it's December the 6th. I said, well, that just happens to be Dion Fortune's birthday. So I think that is obviously supposed to happen. So yeah, I'll be doing something on December the 6th, later this year, uh, along those lines. Right. And by then I should be deep enough into the writing project for it to be fairly full on. Cool, right. Uh, well, yeah, I think we've covered it all. Thanks, right. Paul. Good nice stuff. And thanks to you for inviting me in to uh, have a chat about subjects that I always enjoy talking about. Yeah, lovely. Nice to have you.